Farmers from all over the world provide us with the food we eat. Modern farming is an industry and today's farmers are helped by the latest machinery and scientific discoveries as were the farmers before them. The early farmers of David were also looking for ways to do their work better. They made improvements which changed the lives of people in their own day and for life that is carried on to the present. But who were the early farmers of David? There are several ways you could find out. One place to go would be the library. There you could learn that for a long time people lived by gathering seeds and fruit and by hunting animals that roamed in herds. They set up camp where the animals grazed and followed the animals when they moved to new pastures. Gradually people and animals got used to living close together. Animals became accustomed to having people nearby and people learned a great deal from watching the animals they lived near. They learned that some animals like cattle, sheep and goats could be tamed and kept together. This gave a more certain supply of meat and milk. In time they also learned that the seeds of some wild plants like wheat and barley could be planted and harvested in one place. Not only was this more convenient, it was also more dependable because the grain could be stored and ground into flour when it was needed. So instead of moving from place to place, the people sowed their crops in one area and stayed for the growing season. This was the beginning of farming and a more settled way of life. They still used tools of stone and flint as people had for tens of thousands of years but now they improved those tools by grinding and polishing. So this time is called the New Stone Age or the Neolithic. Neolithic comes from two Greek words neos meaning new and lithos meaning stone and we use the word Neolithic to talk about the way of life of the first farmers. You could also go to a museum to find out more. There you could see the stone and flint tools these early farmers used. They needed to clear the land of trees so that they could make fields to plant their crops. You could also discover something else that they made. Tombs for the dead. In rocky parts of Britain they were made of large stones, several uprights with another stone laid on top. This formed one or more chambers and sometimes these chambers were covered with earth and stone to form a mound. Some mounds were round and some were long. Archaeologists call these different kinds of monuments chambered tombs. But another way we can get close to the past is to visit the ancient sites themselves and the museum might give you a clue as to the ones nearby. A look at an ordnance survey map can show you exactly where to go. Look for the words burial chamber. The David Archaeological Trust can also tell you where to find these chambered tombs. They have computerized records of over 20,000 ancient sites in the county. 
and have plotted them all on maps. When you get there, take time to look carefully. Remember, people deliberately chose these spots. Try to imagine yourself back in time. Try to imagine building one of these monuments in this particular place. Here are some other things to look for. We'll be finding out more about them later. How many uprights are there? Do all the uprights touch the capstone? How large is the chamber? Are there other large stones outside the chamber? forming a semicircle? Do all the stones have the same texture? Well, they didn't dig a hole. What would the first thing you do on the floor? Look at the burial chamber from a distance. Look at the view from the tomb. It may have marked a group's territory or grazing land. Remember, the chamber may have been covered with a mound of earth and stones, or it may have been left bare. People have been visiting chambered tombs for hundreds of years. They have drawn them and described them. One group even went so far as to see how many people on horseback could fit in the chamber of the tomb called Pentre Ivan. Pupils at Newport Primary School also visited some chambered tombs as part of an end of term project. In one case they didn't have far to go because there is one only walking distance from their school called Kare Koitan. Their guide was Terry John, who is the youth and schools liaison officer for the Pembrokeshire Coast National Parks. He told them how the tombs were made and how they were used. Although today only the uprights and capstone remain, originally there would have been smaller stones fitted together to fill in the gaps. Not all the uprights touched the capstone either. Moving one of these stones may have been the way into the tomb. When someone died, the body was placed on a hillside or a platform, exposed to the forces of nature until nothing but the bleached bones remained. Or sometimes the body was placed in a grave and then later dug up and placed in the tomb. This is an actual tomb and the bones archaeologists found inside. At first glance it looks like a jumble. But by looking carefully archaeologists can discover several things they can tell whether a bone belonged to an adult, a teenager, or a child. A child's leg bones, for example, would be small compared to an adult's. Then by fitting the bones together, they can see which belonged to the same individual. By doing this, the jumble of bones becomes the parts of many different people. And as you can see, it wasn't always entire skeletons that were placed in the tombs. It's also likely that some bones were removed at a later time, 
perhaps for ceremonies on other sites or to another family's tomb. Axes, pots and other important objects were also placed with the bones or buried at the entrance. We can imagine that fires were burned and people danced. The next stop was Pentre Ivan, the largest and best preserved chambered tomb in David. It had once been concealed within a large long mound. Fastened together. Here they saw they some of the objects bronze, Neolithic away, people had actually made. They were brought by Nikki Bignall, mm -hmm. who lives in Newport mm -hmm. and has a keen well, interest in archaeology. She had been loaned the artifacts from Kamadi Museum. She showed them an axe that would and have been the, fixed the, uh, into a wooden handle well. and tied with leather thongs so to keep it in place. They learned that there had been factories in the hills not far from where they were sitting. And they saw arrowheads that Neolithic people had made. For although they were farmers, they still did some hunting and fishing and went to war. They then went to Karek Samson, a tomb with a polygonal, a many-sided chamber. They could see how it had been made with two different kinds of stone, one rough and one smooth. And they talked about how it was actually built. The site had to be made level, using picks and shovels made of bone and antler. And the stones had to be chosen, special stones, just the right shape and size. Then they were levered onto a sledge which moved on rollers. The stone was tied with ropes made of strips of leather plated together. Some people pushed and some pulled. Others moved the rollers from the back to the front until they reached the site. Holes were dug, just the right size and shape, so that the stones would fit upright in them. Then the capstone had to be put in place. With the uprights set, a mound was built over the sides, so that the capstone could be positioned. These monuments were another way for a community to say, this is our place. That's about four to five thousand years old. It held the bones of their ancestors, who had probably farmed the same land, Spring, early summer, perhaps, would be the best and time. covered with a mound. Firmer, rain, it could probably be seen by other people, many miles away. The last stop was up a mountainside in Llanunda. This tomb was slightly different because the capstone was fitted into the hillside and the uprights were only at the front. When this tomb was made, people were burning the bones and putting the cinders into the chamber. They put other things in as well. This one held smooth stones and bits of pottery along with the charcoal. Castle. But this time, back in the classroom, the pupils thought about how levers could be used to move a big load, and how a capstone might have been put in place using levers and ropes. They made a model of a chambered tomb, the uprights covered with earth, and the capstone on a sledge. With a capstone on top of the mound, a trench could be dug to remove the timbers. Then if the sledge was slightly smaller than the capstone, the stone would drop down onto the uprights to form the chamber. Oh, 
But moving a model of a capstone is one thing. They wanted to know how much a capstone really weighs. So they decided to find the weight of the capstone of Kare Koitan. They could see that the capstone at one end was roughly the shape of a triangle. And they could think of the capstone as a series of smaller and smaller triangles. To work out the volume of the stone, they would need to calculate the area of several of these triangles. Add them together to find the total area and divide that number by the number of triangles to get the average area. Then they would take the average area and multiply it by the length to arrive at the volume of the capstone. To get the measurements, one student had to climb on the top of the burial chamber. At any other time this would not be allowed. They measured the sides of six triangles, 50 centimeters apart. Two other students measured the length. and the others recorded the measurements. The volume of the capstone was two cubic meters. Back in the classroom, they used that figure to calculate the weight of the capstone. To do this, they took a smaller piece of stone, like the one that the capstone was made of, and found its weight in two ways. The first was in milliliters. They dropped the stone into water and measured the amount spilled out of the container. This is another way of saying how much space the stone takes up. In other words, its volume. How much do you think it was? How many cc's? The volume of the small stone was 194 milliliters. The second method was to weigh the stone. And they found it weighed 600 grams. With these three measurements, can you find the weight of the capstone? The capstone weighed over 6,000 kilograms. That's about as much as this lorry weighs. Fill the lorry and you have the weight of the capstone at Pentre Ivan. Pentre Ivan, an age ago, 4,000 years since Neolithic man did sweat to build a monument. In many a place they stood, large stones. They travelled far to find the rock to cap it all. These massive stones a chamber formed and earth around rose high to cover all. This cromlech then at festive times would open out its heart and then dig in to keep forevermore bones. Centuries of storms, wild winds and weather did take away the mound of earth and soil around. Now stands the skeleton Proud, tall, sturdy Pentreiva defies all, defends the Newport Nevin Valley. Walk through, my friend, and enter the paradise we live in.